Okay, we've covered sensory memory, and some of that information gets passed on to short-term memory, and some of the information in short-term memory gets passed on to what we understand as the final stage of memory, known as long-term memory, or LTM. As far as scientists know, the capacity for long-term memory, how much information long-term memory can hold, appears to be infinite. There's probably some limit, but nobody's ever come close to it. For example, you've probably never met a person who, in the middle of class, went, oh my god, my long-term memory is full. I can't learn another thing. Even Albert Einstein, right, arguably the smartest person in the world, never got to the point where he said, my memory's full. I guess I'll stop and go to the beach. Right? Never happened. So as far as we know, the capacity for long-term memory is infinite. Uh, it's amazing how much people can remember. Forget about people. Birds. Bird brain, right? That's supposed to be an insult. Birds can remember an amazing amount in long-term memory. For example, the Clark's Nutcracker hides 6,000 different acorns and nuts and things to eat during the winter. Now in California, birds don't have to be that smart because food's available year round. But in places in the world where winter means no food, your survival depends on your ability to find food, hide food, and then remember where that food is later. And you can't just put it anywhere, right? You have to hide it very carefully so that other people don't steal your food. So these 6,000 different locations that this bird can remember, they're not easy locations. It's an incredible feat. And bird brains are teeny. So our brains can hold a whole heck of a lot. If we take the three memory systems all together, we can summarize them as follows. Sensory memory can hold actually quite a bit of information for a very brief amount of time, and it holds the information that it holds is sensory, right? Input from your eyes or your ears. Short-term memory can remember, can, has a capacity of about seven plus or minus two items, and it can hold those items for about 15, 20 seconds maybe at the most. And then long-term memory, as far as we know, has an unlimited capacity and a duration that lasts as long as you do. Okay, so let's drill down into long-term memory and talk about the different types of long-term memory. So the first major division between, uh, within the category of long-term memory is to divide it up according to whether those memories are something you have conscious access to or not. The difference between conscious and unconscious memories is described in psychology as the difference between implicit memories and explicit memories. So explicit memories are memory, memories that you can consciously and intentionally with, recall. Uh, they include memories from your own life, which is called episodic memory. And I think of that as like soap operas. Each soap opera has an episode. So episodic memory is episodes of my life. And then there's semantic memory, which just means your memory of facts, basic facts that you know and other people know. The other category of long-term memory is implicit memory. And implicit memory is, cannot be consciously recalled. Right? It's an unconscious kind of memory. And this includes classical conditioning, which we talked about, remember Pavlov, but more importantly for us, Remember John B. Watson's um, uh, demonstration with little Albert where he taught a little baby to be afraid of furry things? That kind of memory. Um, and also procedural memory. So let's go through these. So examples of implicit memory. I said procedural memory. Procedural memory is your memories for how to do things. Do you remember how to tie your shoes? Do you remember how to ride a bicycle? Sometimes procedural memory is referred to with the phrase muscle memory. Same thing. What do I mean about these memories being unconscious? I mean, you are aware of the fact that you can ride a bicycle, sure. But here's the thing. Could you, with words, describe how to ride a bicycle to someone who's never ridden a bicycle before? Well, the beginning is easy, right? You sit on the seat, 
You put your hands on the, not the steering wheel, the handles, handlebar. Um, you put one foot on one pedal, you push, you put the other foot on the pedal and you move the pedals around. Okay, except that's never gonna work. The person's gonna fall over immediately because so much of riding a bicycle is learning how to balance on a bicycle. Even though you're, you're shifting around your center of gravity, right? Watch parents try to explain to children what they need to do to learn how to ride a bicycle. It, it's basically pedal faster, right? That's about it. Because we don't have conscious awareness to exactly what we do to ride a bicycle. Here's another example. Have you ever, say, been walking across campus and someone stops and asks you for directions? Easy. And you try to explain to them where a building is and you go, you know what, just follow me. That's kind of an example. Sometimes our knowledge of where things are in space isn't easily accessible to our conscious awareness. So for example, if you asked me, you know, how many traffic lights do I go through between the time I get off the 101 and the time I get to my home? I don't know. I know, I drive it all the time, but I don't know, right? Implicit memory, unconscious memory. I'm going to explain the difference between implicit and explicit memory with a fascinating case study. But before I can get there, I need to take a little pit stop at the concept of amnesia. And amnesia is when you lose long-term memory. Um, it's a severe memory loss, and it usually results from a brain in injury or brain disease, maybe brain surgery. Uh, it turns out that there are different types of amnesia. You can have either forward acting or backward acting amnesia. So you can have a kind of amnesia where you can remember events after your brain damage, but not before, right? So you can create new memories, but you can't remember the old ones. Um, that would be retrograde, right? You can't remember the old ones, retrograde amnesia. Anterior grade amnesia is the forward moving time. Anterior grade is, oh, my, my memory for what happened before my brain damage is fine, but what I can't do is form new memories. And if you've seen the movie 50 Dates, 50 First Dates with Drew Barrymore, Drew Barrymore has a kind of anterior grade amnesia in that movie. Why am I talking about this? Well, there's a very famous man I learned his name is patient HM, because when you're talking about patients or someone with brain damage, psychologists want to protect their identity, so they don't use their name while the person is alive. After the person's deceased, you might learn the name if the person's family is okay with that. But usually by that point, scientists are so used to calling them by their initials that in this case, this gentleman whose actual name is Henry Mollison, will probably always be a patient HM coming out of my mouth. But here's the thing, patient HM had terrible epilepsy. And epilepsy is when there's a storm of neural activity in your brain. Um, and that storm of neural activity can cause everything from a momentary loss of awareness to a crippling seizures that bring someone to the ground and they, they can't control it at all, can't control their muscles. Imagine having epilepsy and crossing a, a major street or, or driving and then having an epileptic seizure, either in a crosswalk or while you're driving. Not good, right? So epilepsy can be um, very limiting to one's life. Nowadays, we have more um, pill-based medication treatment, but before that existed, doctors who were doing research to try to figure out how to end epilepsy did some pretty barbaric things, including finding people who were suffering from epilepsy and cutting out significant portions of their brain. And that is what happened to patient HM. He had severe epilepsy, and in an attempt to stop the epilepsy, a surgeon removed uh, the bottom part of the temporal lobe on each side of his brain 
and it removed a part of the brain called the hippocampus. Actually, you have two of them, one on each, one in each side of your brain, and so hippocampi. The surgery helped. The surgery was back in 1953, and it actually helped his epilepsy. He had fewer epileptic seizures. But here's the problem. After the surgery, patient HM discovered that he could not form any new memories. He had severe anterior grade amnesia. He could remember most things from his past, but at the point of his surgery and all the way into the future, so he had the surgery in 1953, he lived until 2008. Eight. So we're looking at 55 years. For 55 years, this man could not create new memories. What is that kind of amnesia like? Well, with patient HM, you could put lunch in front of him and he would eat the lunch and you could take the lunch away, wait a couple of minutes, put another lunch in front of him, he'd eat the lunch. <laughs> you could take it away, wait another few minutes, give him another lunch. He wouldn't remember that he had just eaten lunch. Um, so, you know, he couldn't hold a job, that sort of thing. So what he liked to do was watch classic movies. Actually, they were never classic for him. They were always new for him. So he could watch the same movie over and over and over and over and over again because it was always new to him. He had to be reminded that his parents had died. Um, maybe the weirdest thing is... Imagine, so his memory systems basically stopped when he was 27 at the age of, or in the year of 1953. Uh, imagine remembering yourself as 27 years old and getting up in the morning and looking in the mirror to brush your teeth and a 70 year old man looks back. Imagine being 27, getting up, expecting to see your 27 year old face and instead what do you see? a 70-year-old version of yourself. Whoa, that had to be weird. But that is anterior grade amnesia, and that's what patient HM's life was like. Now, I've told you a overly simplified version of the story. There's a fascinating kink. So we talked about the difference between explicit and implicit memory. And so far, all the examples that I've given you were conscious memory, right? I don't remember having seen this movie before. It turns out that patient HM's amnesia was only for the explicit conscious type of memory. He retained his implicit memories. So he could, he had the ability to create new implicit memories. But he didn't, he didn't have awareness into that because implicit memories are unconscious. So how do we know this? Well, researchers would give him certain tasks like learning how to play the Tower of Hanoi or learning how to trace shapes by looking at the mirror reflection of the shape, um, which turns out to be really tricky. If you've ever tried to say cut your own hair in the mirror, it's really hard to deal with the mirror reflection because everything's backwards. Um, at least the left right is backwards. Um, so what people would do, researchers would do, would be to go see Henry Mollison, patient HM, knock on the door. Each day he was, who are you? And even though they had seen him for decades, they would have to explain to him who they were and what they wanted. And then they'd come in and they'd ask him to say, solve this puzzle known as the Tower of Hanoi, which involves moving disks around in a particular, with a particular set of rules. And Henry Mollison would say, I've never seen this toy before. I, and this whole time he's telling you about how he's never seen the toy before and he has no idea what this puzzle is about. His hands are solving the puzzle. He'll tell you he'd never drawn uh, um, from a mirror image or traced a shape from a mirror image in his life. And yet he would do it. And each time he did it, he got more accurate and faster. So he could learn new implicit memories, but not explicit memories. So patient HM gives us a really interesting case study in the separation of implicit and explicit memory in your brain. They have to rely on different brain areas because patient HM had one, but not the other. Okay. 
Now you may hear about patient HM and think, oh wow, how awful to have amnesia. And granted, it's not easy. But did you know that you have amnesia too? It's called infantile amnesia or sometimes childhood amnesia. If you ask people to uh, tell you what their earliest memories are, right? well, how many people remember being born? How many people remember their first birthday? Their second, their third, their fourth? Nothing, I got nothing. Around, when you do studies and ask people to recall their first memories, you, most people have their first memories around the age of about five, maybe four or five. There's a few people who say they have a memory from when they were two or three. Of course, you always have to check the accuracy of those memories. Um, but you basically have amnesia for the first few years of your life. Does that bother you, that kind of amnesia? No, right? You don't miss something that you've never had. Um, why do we have infantile or childhood amnesia? Well, it turns out that the hippocampus, which is very, very important, actually necessary for converting information from short-term memory into long-term memories that last, which is a process called consolidation, but you need the hippocampus to do that consolidation. And until you're about three or four years of age, your hippocampus isn't mature enough to enable you to create explicit memories, right? Yeah, explicit long-term memories. Now, you can create memories as a child, absolutely, but they tend to be the implicit type. So when you ask people what their first memories are, obviously they can only tell you about the explicit type. Okay, that's it for this segment. Come back and I'll tell you about how research on memory can make the lives of students a whole lot better. <laughs>